Cowery, our scouting director for PBR Ohio. With us, we got our assistant scouting director, Genesis Hillard. We're going to go through today, give you guys a quick inside look on how the rankings are formulated. It's ranking season. We just got done seeing over 2,000 guys. Uh, so this is our war room, so to speak. This is where we break down players. We're going to give you a little insight how we break down pitchers, position players, give them an overall grade, and how that actually ends up going into our final rankings. This whiteboard here, by the time you're done seeing it, will have over a thousand names on it, breaking down video, breaking down stats, track and blast, all the incredible technology we have at our disposal. But this is far from just a me and Genesis process. Before this is done, there's gonna be hundreds of phone calls to high school coaches, college coaches, pro scouts, summer coaches. We get as much input as possible. I guess at the end of the day, um, this is a tool to help players, all right? This is not something that uh, we are super egotistical about, hey, this is our rankings. What we do is we're trying to give college coaches a tool to go out and identify players so they make their own educated decision on the process. All right, so we're gonna give you guys a quick inside look on how we evaluate pitchers. Now, obviously it's way more in depth than this. We're gonna break down film, we're gonna look at track man, um, but we're gonna give you a basic outline on the evaluation process and how that eventually factors into the rankings. So our evaluation process starts here, okay? We hold showcases where we see guys. Now a showcase, that's more of raw stuff, all right? We're seeing the athleticism, the movement pattern, stuff I'll cover over here in a second. Games is where we see if that actually translates, okay? So if a guy shows well in a showcase, that's part of the equation, but he's got to conquer this next obstacle, which is the games as well. But also on top of this, we call more coaches than you could possibly imagine, all right? I'm talking from summer coaches, high school coaches, college coaches. We get as much uh, input as possible. But the physical stuff we're looking at, all right? So all, everything ends up going into an overall grade, all right? It's basically your college projection, and that's, that's how the rankings are formulated. We go all the way from a power five draft prospect down to a guy that might be able to make a college roster, all right? When we're looking at pitchers, these are the physical things we're looking at. Number one, velocity ceiling and NCTs, okay? NCTs are what I call non-coachable traits. Athleticism, arm speed. Uh, a rule in the scouting game is everybody can get better, athletes get better way faster. So we're gonna mention a few guys here in a second that fit some of these traits, but that's the first thing, all right? So it's not the number exactly that you see on a prospect's PBR page, all right? So if a guy's 86 versus another guy that's 86, not all 86s are created equal, if that makes sense, all right? If you're a five foot eight, 220 pound guy throwing 86, it's not the same thing as a six foot four, 165 guy, 65 pound guy throwing 86 because the second guy I talked about usually has a better chance of being higher in the long run. So I think one of the misconceptions is we're just looking at the velocity number. Uh, that could be further from the case. We're watching film, um, we're breaking down the athleticism, the movement patterns, the arm speed, all these non-coachable traits that once you step onto campus, it's harder for a college coach to develop, all right? So after we get a look at the NCTs, the stuff, we're gonna go to pitch ability, all right? So these are kind of 1A, 1B, all right? If you can't throw strikes, you're not going to pitch at the next level, but if you don't have a certain amount of velocity, you're not going to get to the next level to begin with. So velocity is kind of like your, it's like a uh, job requirement, so to speak. It's not the end all be all, but you have to have a certain amount of this for this to matter, if that makes sense. So then we go, can they throw strikes? So at a showcase, most people can throw strikes, all right? So we look at that. If you don't have to throw strikes at a showcase, typically a red flag, but really where we see pitchability is in the games. Or we talk to coaches that say, hey, yeah, this guy can fill it up, okay? So these are kind of 1A, 1B. Do you, have the, do you have the ability to throw at a velocity that's gonna be able to get outside the next level? And then you can you get it over the plate, all right? And these next two kind of go together as well, all right? When we look at your secondary offerings, all right? That kind of decides whether you're a starter or reliever at the next level. All right, so a guy that profiles as a starter is going to get a higher overall grade than the guy that throws that reliever simply because there's less of them. Like when you talk about short stops or left-handed hitters, like there's less of these guys than there are of these guys. So typically, when you're looking at a starter, it's a guy that doesn't have to break his back to throw a velocity. Does the ball come out easy 
And does he have two of these? That's the next thing. Can he throw a breaking ball and a changeup consistently or two other pitches that are able to get hitters out? Because over a course of five, six innings, you're going to need more than two pitches to be able to start at the next level. Versus a reliever, if we're talking pure stuff, when you look at the next level, most relievers have velocity and one primary secondary, all right? Because that will work in a course of one to two innings. But to be able to throw five to six, you're going to need three. So to kind of encapsulate the whole thing, we're looking at what is your potential velocity? Not what it currently is. Can you throw strikes? And then do you have one or two secondaries? That kind of helps us filter down, all right? Which then factors in to your overall grade, which is how we come up with our final rankings. All right, so now we're giving you a little insight on how we evaluate pitchers. We're giving you an example of our prospect report card, okay? So every guy that's going to be in the rankings has something similar to this. They'll have their name on the board, and we're going to go through the things we value, and we're going to grade them or come up with an overall grade. So the guy we're going to use as an example today is Jacob Bean. He's a Kent State commit, a guy that's made giant jumps, and a guy that tests off the charts. All right, so when I look at Jacob Bean, these two things absolutely jump off the page. All right, if you're talking about velocity ceiling and NCTs, non-coachable traits, he grades through the absolute roof. You're looking at a six foot two, 180 pound true athlete. He also plays basketball, ridiculous arm speed. Uh, velocity, NCTs, 99, those, we don't give out those very often, but I truly think this guy has a chance to throw as hard as anybody in the state. His bullpen, both when I saw him up north and at the pro case, absolutely electric. He checks both of these boxes um, and then so. Uh, pitch ability secondary, we're gonna go down. Uh, the pitch ability is in a bullpen, so you'll see that we have that star because he still needs to check off this box, all right? So he's gonna be a guy that raises big time up the rankings, but before we can really, really put that seal of approval on him, we gotta see this, but we've also gotten a lot of this that checks out. So coach's input, he grades really high on that, so we're giving him an edge there, but we still need to see him here. So really high grades still. When I saw him throw twice, now we're talking bullpen, so it's probably only 30 pitches, but he was able to command his fastball in both his secondaries. Curveball's really good, change us well above average. So two really high grades there. Starter reliever. Um, at college, I think he has the ability to start, and that's another huge plus. Now, He's going to go to Kent State, which is loaded. All right, and you have Coach Birkbeck, which also kind of helps him these guys. Coach Birkbeck's maybe the best pitching coach in the country, one of the most respected. Uh, so any deficiencies, he's going to be able to help Jacob out big time there. But I don't see any reason yet why he couldn't start at the next level. But once again, this is very important. We still have to check off this box. All right, so we'll see him this spring. We'll see if he checks off this box. Overall grade is a 97, which I – it's early, he still has to prove it in game, but he has every non-coachable trait to get pro scouts in the stands. All right, so another guy I wanna talk about to give you guys a different example, all right? So the first guy we talk about is Jacob Bean. It doesn't take a seasoned scout to see the electricity there. Now, a guy we're gonna talk about, why I wanna talk about Chris Donkey out of North Royalton High School, is he's a highly ranked guy. He'll be a top 60 guy for us, but he's only 84, 86. Now I say only, that's still, good fastball velocity, but he's going to be ranked higher than a bunch of guys that throw harder than him. All right, so he's a good prospect that I want to take a deeper dive in so that you guys understand, okay, why is this guy ranked higher when his velocity may not be higher, as high as some of the guys behind him, okay? So one, the velocity ceiling is higher than what it currently is because he has NCTs, all right, non-coachable traits. Six foot three, he's also a good athlete, plays basketball, and he has a ton of room to add to his frame. That's another very important thing. Uh, to understand when we do the rankings, right? He's six foot three, but he's an unfinished product. He could easily add 25, 30 pounds in a college weight room, and that 84 to 86 could easily be 90 um, as early as this spring, summer. Whenever that happens for him, I don't think it's a question of if, but a question of when, okay? So he's a guy that we have a higher velocity ceiling than his current velocity output. We saw him at 84, 86 this winter. The, the big reason he's so highly ranked is right here, pitchability, all right? This guy throws strikes every time we see him. All right, I've seen probably 15, 20 innings from Chris, and he fills it up every single time. North-South game, saw him last spring, saw him this past summer. He's never had an issue throwing strikes, 
So he checks off all three of these boxes as well. He's throwing strikes here, he's throwing strikes here. Every coach I talk to says he throws strikes, all right? So he checks that box off. This dude can flat out fill it up, so he's gonna have a higher ranking because of that, all right? And that goes into my secondary. Both secondaries are above average. You throw a curveball, spots up a changeup, both quality offerings. So I think there's very little doubt this is what he ends up being at the next level. And then his overall grade, he's a guy that's uncommitted, but he's going to be ranked ahead of some Division I commits, simply because of all the stuff we said right here. He's going to throw harder. He throws strikes. We have him graded as a future Division I prospect. All right, the first two guys I talked about, we talked about non-coachable traits, and it was everything the eyes can see, athleticism, movement patterns, a guy that's six foot three that has room to add strength. Now we're going to talk about stuff the eyes can't see, all right? We have unbelievable technology with TrackMan uh, that gives us spin rates, how much the ball moves, all that great stuff. And the guy that registers off the charts when it comes to pure stuff is Carson Rhodes. He's a Virginia Tech commit, 2024 out of Salem High School. So when you look at these raw numbers, obviously they look good, all right? Elite fastball at 92.9, mid 70s breaking ball, near 80 mile an hour slider. but. When you dive deeper, you understand how ridiculous this stuff actually is for its age. So, fastball's at 2,300 RPMs, well above average. Slider, breaking ball, both 2,600 RPMs, which is elite for his class, all right? But, the important thing to notice is everything comes out of this release height. So, we, everything, TrackMan measures everything for us. So, all these pitches come out of this from the same arm angle, all right? And the fastball has IEDV, induced vertical break, which is very important for the next thing I'm about to say. So when he throws the ball, basically, excuse my terrible drawing, but everything comes out of the same tunnel, everything comes out of uh, the same arm slot. But what the high spin and high induced vertical break do for him is it gives the fastball almost a rising effect to the hitter, which makes that fastball almost incredibly hard to get on top of and it makes it appear faster than even that 93 mile an hour fastball actually is. So his fastball actually plays up. But once the ball gets to about here, everything looks the same to a hitter. So he has th these three pitches that are all about the same out of the hand, and then it's like a firework breaks off. The fastball looks like it goes up, curveball looks like it goes down, slider looks like it cuts across, all right? So, he not only does he have three elite pitches stuff-wise, they're coming out of the same tunnel, they all control different planes, a hitter has almost no chance because you can't pick it up until very late in the sequence, and then you combine that with the elite velocity, uh, good luck hitters. All right, now we're gonna give you guys a quick look on how we evaluate position players, all right? Similar process to pitchers. How it goes is, we see guys in showcase, we see the tools, all right? So if you talk about the tools, measure speed by a 60, hit, the eye test, power, we use blast, exit velocity, all that kind of stuff. Field, also the eye test, all right? So we're seeing guys that do we think can stick at in a certain position at the next level. Throw, we use your position velocity. So all these tools are measured here. Now, in the game of baseball, we need to see this, and we also rely on this, all right? So we're gonna go out and see guys in the spring and summer to see if these tools that we've measured at our showcase translate to this, but we're also going to rely on college coaches opinion, summer coaches opinion, high school's opinion, high school coaches opinion. We talked to hundreds of those guys before the rankings are released. All right. The other aspect we look at right here, which is really important, I call it seven on seven. All right. Only 7% of guys go on to play at the next level in high school. I think Ohio might be slightly higher than that. But what I mean by that is if you're hitting, are you facing a guy that's in that 7%? All right, are you facing a guy that's gonna pitch at the next level? Because if you're not, although it may be a good result, it's not something we seriously take into consideration because you're not gonna face that guy at the next level. So seven on seven at bats have a very high priority. If we're seeing a guy that we know is gonna pitch at the next level and you're productive on him, that's really gonna help your overall grade. All right, from a college coach's perspective, in the rankings, what you'll see is there's a priority of the middle of the field, all right? If I draw a straight, circle here, these are your positions that are going to get recruited first. And if you think about it like on the open market, there's just less of these guys, all right? The hardest position, in my opinion, to find in the state of Ohio is a guy that can do this at the college level, all right? You just don't see many of them. I had a guy at Wright State that I coached, Mitch Roman. 
He saved us so many runs because he's a true shortstop. He's still playing in pro ball today. An unbelievable defender. Those guys are really hard to find. All right, and then it goes to these two guys when you're talking outfielders. All right, guys that can really defend behind the dish, really tough to find. Guys that can patrol center field, really tough to find. So from a ranking standpoint, we kind of follow the recruiting uh, paradigm as you would, is from the middle, those guys typically have a higher grade just because they're harder to find. That doesn't mean that we don't value these guys because they also have obviously a place at the next level. But what you'll notice from the recruiting timeline, these guys come off the board first simply because they're less defined. So summarize, we'll measure your tools at a showcase, see if it checks off in game. We'll talk to your coaches to see if they can back up we've seen. And then in game, we try to target the seven on seven matchups. All right, so now we're gonna break down a, a prospect that I think has a really good combination of tools, but want to place the importance on these two things. All right, so this is a guy that we've been able to see a ton here and a ton here, and he's always produced. We're talking about Mason Onati. He's a Tulane commit 2023 out of Olentangy Liberty High School. We gave him an overall grade of a 97, which means he's a guy that we think next year that pro scouts are going to go out and see. All right, when you break him down, the numbers are good, but they're not like otherworldly good. Like speed wise, he's right around a seven runner, but the reason we gave him a B plus here is because it plays up here. All right, and that brings me back to these two points. All right, in game, the instincts are through the roof. He knows when to take the extra bag. He just, he's a son of a coach. He knows what he's doing on the field. So the seven plays up due to the baseball instincts. All right, hit, same thing. He's like a 95 exit velo guy, but barrels everything. He's a guy that can be very versatile throughout the lineup. You can put him at the top. At the early stage of his college career, he might start at the bottom, but he's a guy that can play significant roles, power. He's going to grow into that, but this is the big reason why he's a top 15 player in the state, which is what I hit on earlier. He can do this better than just about anybody we've seen. All right, like I said earlier, guys that can do that are graded higher because they're just so rare. So when you break down the entire package, you're looking at a guy that will show well in a showcase, but in reality, we had to see him in this and this before he was really a highly regarded prospect, and he grades through that through the roof. All right, next we're going to break down a prospect that uh, I think might be slightly undervalued now. He definitely was by me at first. I had him severely underranked because he's a guy, once again, that shows well in this, but we had to see this and this before we had a true grade on him. And that's Rodney Rachel out of Baden High School. Um, we have an overall grade as a 92, which means I think he's a Division I player. Um, and it comes down to these two things that really stand out to me about Rodney is the power potential. So this is where you get to dig deeper into the numbers, all right? He has a 98 EV, which is exit velocity, really good, all right? But these two numbers are through the roof, all right? Our partners with Blast allow us to go deeper and allow us to understand what a prospect is capable of. So maybe it's mechanical changes, maybe it's growing into his body, but with 26.1 hand speed and 86 mile an hour bat speed, that's elite, all right? I don't know if we've measured anything higher than that. So this number you can expect to go up in the future, all right? And then we saw a play in game, which comes to this right here. When we saw this dude play in game, the makeup's through the roof, all right? He was at the North-South game, some of the best players in the state. These guys gravitated towards him. He's an alpha personality. He's a guy that, if you get up and when he goes to a big stage at the division one level, it's not going to scare him a bit. He's going to be ready for the moment. He thinks he's one of the best players on the field and for good reason, because he is one of the best players on the field. This is the type of guy that I think you buy stock in now because it's going to get higher. A guy that I have very little doubt that's going to be able to contribute at the next level. All right. Another guy I want to talk about is an example of a guy that we think has the chance to be an elite prospect. All right. Because he has the tools, but what he also has is untapped potential, and that's Brady Shannon. He's an outfielder out of Youngstown to Ursuline High School. Um, this is a guy that you're going to notice right away when you go to a showcase. He takes BP, the whole crowd stops, he's going to hit three or four out. He's hit probably the furthest ball we've ever uh, actually covered at PBR. Cleared the trees at Chillicothe Paint Stadium, so we've seen it playing game. So he has the size, you're looking at a six foot three, well put together dude, uh, power potential through the roof. Hit, we'll get to in a second. Arm to be determined. Speed, more than good enough. He's a quarter outfield type um, projection. But 
the reason we think Brady has such a high ceiling is you're looking at a guy that has never been able to focus just on baseball. He's a star quarterback. If he wasn't going to play baseball, he would have been a Division I quarterback. He also played guard on his basketball team. So you're looking at a guy that all these grades right now, almost all of them are to be determined because he hasn't ever got to put his full efforts into baseball. I think power potential is obvious. Hit, you give him whatever you wanted, but once he gets, once he goes to UCF, gets 100 Division I at bats under his belt, he's going to continue to develop there. Arm, I think, is another big one. Obviously, as a Division I quarterback recruit, you have the arm strength. Maybe the number doesn't translate there. I think he's mid-80s now, but I think once that goes to strictly throwing a baseball, you're going to see a huge uptick there. Um, he's just a guy that I think the sky's the limit, and once he becomes a baseball-only athlete, look out. I wouldn't be shocked at all if he's a draft guy out of UCF. Another quick thing I want to hit on is, because um, it, it, it bugs me sometimes, is when guys drop. All right, one thing I want you guys to understand is this is much more than us just putting numbers on a whiteboard. Like, a lot of these guys I'm talking about that are gonna drop, um, I've had conversations with them, I've had phone calls with, we're trying to help them go to the next level. Uh, but our job is to grade it out. At the end of the day, um, we gotta take the personal side out of it. But if you drop, that doesn't mean that we value you less, you less as a prospect. I think that's a big misconception, all right? Like I said earlier, we give everybody an overall grade. All right, so your overall grade could stay the exact same, but the reality of the situation is we think you see thousands of guys every year that we hadn't seen when you were ranked previous. So the best example I can give you is you go to a high school with 100 kids. Your GPA is, say, a 3.9. So now your overall rank in that class, let's say you're 17th in that class. All right, so now you transfer high schools. Now this school has 800 kids. Your GPA remains 3.9, but in reality, now your rank is 129. So I think that's another big point to hit on, is if you drop in the rankings, one, this is fluid. All right, if you improve, you're gonna go back up. But two, a lot of the times, this stays the same. The overall grade stays the same. In reality, this is the number that changes. We've only seen 100 guys, now we see 800 guys. Just a law of numbers, it has nothing to do to reflect on your natural ability.